Marva Today with Don Rush. Next Tuesday, voters will get their chance to decide whether to keep the Wacomico County executive position. You're listening to Don Marva Today. This is Don Rush. There's been a long-running conflict between the council and the county executive since voters approved the position some 18 years ago. Since then, the acrimony seems to have grown over the years. The late county executive, Bob Culver, now the current occupant, Julie Giordano. We have two interviews this afternoon, one with the county executive, Julie Giordano, and the other with Council President John Cannon. And we begin with Cannon, who, along with all but two of his colleagues on the county council, voted to put the measure on the ballot. What prompted you and obviously some of your other colleagues on the council to decide to put this up for a referendum? And we've had this form of government for many years over like, I guess, three individuals or actually four. What prompted all of this? Well, um, I, I think it's just led to a series of frustrations, I think, on the part of the county council and as part of the citizens of Wicomico County as well, Don. Uh, there were similar circumstances, I'd say about eight years ago, where there was a lot of fallout and a lot of concerns over the uh, uh, unilateral decisions being made by the executive branch of government that concerned a lot of the citizens and concerned the county council as well. Uh, we decided at that point in time, let's just stick it out, let's move forward and see where, you know, where we end up. But, you know, it's been 18 years now. And we have to, you know, I think it's maybe time to reconsider where we are uh, what we've really accomplished with this form of government has been about $10 million in expenses, and it's up to about eight, over $800,000 a year. Um, I believe the question really comes up as to, you know, what exactly are we getting when we're, you know, having two, bran- two branches of government actually doing what we feel one branch of government could do quite well, if not even better. So one of the arguments for a county executive is that you have a single voice who can – pay full-time attention to the issues and even go up to Annapolis to lobby uh, for things that the county wants. Um, That seems pretty attractive. Uh, We've heard that. We've heard that 100 percent. I know that's part of a recent forum. uh, But, you know, you have to ask yourself. I've been to Annapolis several times as president of the council. I went every week during, uh, during general assemblies. I've been in the governor's office. So I've managed to do that just from a council perspective. My concern really is, what do you have? They say, you know, you're one call away from the governor. But what happens if that governor really doesn't get along that well with your executive? That could possibly isolate your county from any type of, uh, you know, future benefits on, on, on behalf of the state of Maryland. Uh, we, find, we find that same type of, you know, isolated oversight locally, even with the management of our employees, they say, well, you know, you have a president of the United States, you have a governor of Maryland, why don't you have an executive in the county? Well, it's a lot different in the county level. The executive has so much more control over the day-to-day legislation and the actual operations of the employees that it's not anywhere near the same and exposes you to quite a bit of issues should you have bad management uh, on the part of the uh, of the executive branch, which we have seriously experienced over the last several years. So one of the things that you bring up is the expense. And one of the issues that was brought up during a recent forum at SU was, well, you could get rid of the county executive, but then the question is, are there other people then you will have to then hire in order to fill in, as it were, uh, that vacancy in terms of responsibility and decision-making? What's What about that? I mean, do you anticipate that there would have to be additional personnel if you got rid of uh, the county executive? I think based on prior councils before we got into this, um, my guess is, Don, that we probably save a minimum of about uh, a half a million dollars, $500,000 a year uh, to to function as a county council as a whole. So you don't see any additional um, uh, hiring in order to uh, go ahead and fill this vacuum? No, I don't think there would be a vacuum. You have the seven members of the council who are more than sufficiently addressing the issues that the executive would, would address. And then we would also hire a, council, a county administrator who would oversee the day-to-day operations. So here you would have an actual professional county administrator with experience in business and finance and, uh, and management. And you're not just sort of like, you know, um, rolling the dice to see what type of an executive you're going to get in four years. You have seven members of a council together with a professional county administrator overseeing the day-to-day operations of the county government. I know part of it in that, in that, um, in that forum as well, 
They said, well, you know, it takes two weeks to get to the – I have to wait two weeks to talk to the county council about it. I couldn't see that, that where that is could be any further from the truth. Yes, you may be able to talk to the executive in the same day, but what happens if you're that department head or that agency who disagrees with the executive and the executive doesn't even want to talk to them about what initiatives they might be interested in? The seven-member council, you do it in public. You have seven people to talk to. You can talk to any council member within within five minutes because every single one of them has a cell phone. So that was another, I think, uh, uh, sort of misrepresentation during that form, form, you know, during that form as well. I mean, we, Don, you know as well as I do, with the executive form of government, we've seen proposals and studies costing tens of thousands of dollars that either the executive has not executed on or they've just sat on a shelf. Well, that sounds as if we're in many ways, particularly that particular item, we're talking about just simply the people who have occupied the position. Um, would you, for instance, have be come to this point if, say, for instance, John Pesota had been elected? He was obviously the county administrator, and uh, he ran. Uh, he sounds much more as if he would get along with the council as opposed to, say, someone uh, who was elected outside, whether it's Giordano or Culver. Yeah, I always try to stay away from the individual um, executives, to be quite honest with you. There are circumstances, I think, where you see, you know, across the entire spectrum of executives who either um, are not going to take the initiatives that maybe uh, the, the county needs, or else you're going to see executives who run roughshod over the um, uh, over the county legislative process or the, the employees. So I don't want to be get into the particulars of it. I just think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that, you know, you have a seven-member council that has always proven to be quite reliable. They have to work in concert with each other. They have to work in collaboration. The checks and balances on a county council is within the seven members themselves inherently, as well as together with the public. And that's the big difference, because with an executive form of government, We've seen numerous violations, either whether it was the safari at the quarry, whether it's tax sales that were canceled, whether it's capital projects that literally came to a standstill. You've, you're familiar with the encryption issue we just recently had and the removal of the recycling station. These are all unilateral decisions made by executives, more than one executive. There is no, no checks and balances there, very limited transparency done. And that's, that's what our concern really is. And we're not complaining about it. We're just saying that we think there's a better system that's already been a proven system that we're lucky enough to be able to go, to go back to. Because one of the things that I observe is if you have responsibility diffused among as, as seven individuals as opposed to a single individual, then responsibility then begins to blur in terms of, well, who's responsible for um, decision X or Y? And it's much different to, say, vote out a county executive, right, a single person, as opposed to trying to figure out who on the council you want to vote out. And obviously you have districts and so on. I mean, it seems as if it's much more complicated at the council level to, say, remove somebody if you don't like them or take some action against somebody. Speak to that. Well, I think it's actually easier. You know, you have your representative in a particular district, and those individuals, they're responsible right, you know, directly to those actual individuals. And I think that's actually a better process. Right now, you have a, what they try to say is a checks and balances system, but it doesn't exist, Don. I mean, we have situations just with the management alone that's you know causing quite a few problems. We did a there was an independent survey done, literally an independent survey done more recently, where uh, the employees took a survey. We've got 25 percent of our employees who who say they've experienced harassment, intimidation, and bullying on the job. And then you have another 20 percent turnover in 2023. These are the issues where the executive single-handedly manages. Uh, the oversight of the employees, the county council cannot even talk to department heads. If you come to me and say, John, I want a street sign on my road, I can't tell you, I can't go to the department head and get it for you or even really discuss it because it's not relevant. It has, well, I have to refer you to the county executive, and, and it can get tied up in there. And if the executive doesn't like you, Don, you're out of luck, though. Did you experience that under Culver? Uh, again, I don't want to talk about it, um, individual executives, but we have experienced issues uh, – quite a few issues. It's not just this one county council, trust me, and this one executive. It, these are experiences we have seen over the 18-year period without question. 
Okay, by the way, I want to also ask you, because um, it's been brought up about the uh, the friends of uh, Julie Giordano uh, to elect her, uh, and his mm-hmm. contribution obviously connected with the, uh, with the radios. Um, but isn't that the way private financing of campaigns is all about? I mean, I don't know what your campaign list looks like in terms of contributions, but you may make a decision and I look at a contribution and I say, oh, wait a minute, there must be some connection between his decision and the campaign contribution. What about that? I think it depends on the extreme, the, the degree of, of involvement over and above perception, Don. Uh, you know, this issue came about very much so with this encryption issue where uh, Giordano actually refused to allow Mike Lewis to encrypt the radios, which everybody interpreted as necessary for the safety of his deputies without question. And yet it was, you know, across the board just that uh, Eastern Shore Undercover was going to get one of these radios, and we were going to leave it up to a Facebook blogger at their discretion as to what they would or would not release and at what time to the public. Now, when you also add on that, that that particular one individual gave $3,500 to the executive, I mean, at some point in time, you might think you need to recuse yourself from the decision-making process. I know a county council member would probably recuse themselves. So in terms of um, the county executive, I mean, a lot of emphasis is obviously is, is placed on the current occupant. Um, and there is obviously a lot of discomfort, whether it's some of her decisions uh, regarding, say, Dan Cox and that potential appointment. You mentioned the radios, for example. Um, and people will just say, well, look, um, this is a particular... Uh, county executive, and uh, we may not like her. We're going to vote her out next time. Uh, she's had some real serious misstrips. Uh, but uh, that's how they view it as opposed to, say, a long-term problem uh, with the county executive position itself. I mean, that's how people well, are going to look at it. Well, I understand that. But unfortunately, the, the, the citizens of Wicomico County don't know all the details. I mean, I don't think many citizens of Wicomico County know that property tax sales were actually canceled one year. And they were canceled because the executive at that time happened to owe property taxes and didn't want their name in the newspaper. So they canceled the property taxes. I didn't find out about it until the mayor of Delmar called me and said, John, why are you canceling the, ta- the property tax sales? Delmar depends on that revenue, and I had to I had to call him back because I said I don't know anything about it. But sure enough, that's what happened, and that shouldn't have happened. Um, but again, you talk about the four years, et cetera. You know, we're very fortunate we can we can fall back on a county council, seven member council that has proven itself to be very successful. A seven member council, Don, that gave a Shorebird Stadium, the Henry Parker Sports Complex, the new Civic Center when we needed it. So many of the new schools we've had in the last, you know, you know, 40 or 50 years, these were all decisions made by a seven-member council. And you have to ask yourself, why do we continue with this, the way, the way that things are right now? I mean, I don't think anybody's witnessed this degree of, you know, unhealthy character assassinations you hear about, uh, Pac-14 shows or Facebook posts. Uh, legal battles or uh, social media hysteria we've faced and we've been subjected to over these last several years. Don, we never witnessed that when it was a seven-member county of count, county council that had to work and had to work collaboratively with each other in the public. So we're very fortunate. We do have another option. I think that's what we're pursuing here. Because that seems as if you're focusing on the current county executive, as opposed to, say, Bob Culver and previous county executives, at least, who also came into conflict with you. You're saying you didn't experience this sort of thing before in some fashion or another? It was a previous executive that canceled the tax sales, and it was a previous executive that hired an individual to be our finance director without council approval, so technically this person was not legally working as a bona fide um, a finance director, but he, you know, that the executive continued to pay this individual to do that job. Now, here's the real, here's a real uh, catch on that on that one. We never went to the bond market that year. Probably the first time in 40 years we didn't go to the bond market. Our capital expenses, our capital projects came to an absolute standstill. The reason, because if they had gone to the bond market in New York, New York, and tried to sign on to a 50 million dollar um, bond. That would have probably, there would have probably been some type of fraud involved because that person was not a duly appointed uh, finance director. Now, nobody knows that. The council couldn't control it. We did what we could. We passed seven charter amendments in one year trying to rein the executive branch in 13 over the last 18 years, but it, it, it wasn't enough, Don. 
So we literally came to a standstill. So this doesn't all revolve around one executive nor one council. So finally, and looking ahead, uh, do you think that the county voters are ready to jettison this office, or do you think that they will still be more comfortable with a, a single voice? I, I'm hoping that the citizens should, should probably recognize this seven-member council truly does have a checks and balances system. As I said before, it's inherent in the process. There's more true pan- transparency when, when the decisions are being made publicly uh, in council chambers as opposed to maybe on the third floor of uh, the, the government office building behind closed doors. Uh, budgets for se, Don, the budgets as they are right now, the county executive gets to determine what projects they may or may not send forward to the council. As you know, the council can't add except for education. We can only subtract. So if you were to take a, a project to the executive where you wanted $250,000 for whatever, it is literally up to the discretion of one individual, that one individual, as to whether it's going to get in the budget or not. I think that's a bit of an overstep. Um, again, I talked about the management, the staff, and again, the response in it to citizens. Don, if you want a street, if you want a street sign outside your house, speed limit thirty miles an hour, I can't help you with it. I got to send you to the executive. The executive doesn't like you, and the executive doesn't want to do it. That's it. You're done. So, I'm hoping the public recognizes it for what it was and recognizes that they do have that option to go with what I consider to be a more uh, efficient, effective, uh, and transparent form of government with a seven-member council and a county administrator. Wicomico County Council President John Cannon on his support to eliminate the county executive position. We now turn to the current occupant, Julie Giordano, who in the last election swept aside acting county executive John Pesota after the death of the late Bob Culver. So, Julie, first of all, what do you see as the advantages to having a county executive as opposed to, say, a council-run uh, government? Well, I mean, first and foremost, it's mirrored off of what our country's mirrored off of and what our state government's mirrored off of. So the three branches of government, while I think that, you know, there are probably some flaws, it's the best form of government that we have. And I feel like in Wacomico County, we've made it there. And to just regress back, I think, would just be foolish. So what kind of specific things do you think uh, are advantages? Well, one of the advantages are, you know, for every entity that comes, they get two bites at the apple. You know, I was telling this to anybody in education. It would be, I can't imagine anybody in education voting to go back to a councilmanic form of government because they come to me, you know, for the budget. And if they are not happy with what we've put forward, then they have another bite at the apple with the council. So for every entity, they have two bites at the apple, talking to the executive and then also talking to the council. Um, But the other thing is you have that balance of power. You know, you have checks and balances. Um, You know, when this uh, used to be a councilmanic form of government and then moved to the executive form of government, it was because the people wanted to hold somebody accountable. And um, they didn't feel like there was accountability with the uh, seven members of the council and then just having a county administrator. So the people wanted a say in who was running the government on a daily basis. So one of the things that uh, people who support this amendment point to is this sort of rocky relationship between the county executive on the one hand and the county council on the other, mm-hmm. which reaches back to Bob Culver. Sure. Culver had his own conflicts. Uh, and as I was, matter of fact, when I was talking to uh, Council President uh, John Cannon, um, at the end of uh, Bob's term, he obviously died. There was some question about whether the council people wanted to continue on because of those problems. Obviously, they've decided that they're going to do this. Mm -hmm. What about that relationship? Why is it so rocky? So, well, first and foremost, I think the the first problem is you're saying that the council doesn't want it. It doesn't matter what the council wants. It's what the people of this county want. And the people of this county wanted a county executive, period. They voted for it. And um, and I'll get to your question in a second. When I was out door knocking, when I was campaigning, I knocked over 1,500 doors. Not one person, not one, Republican or Democrat, left or right, said, I don't even think we need a county executive. You know, they did not say that. So that wasn't even brought up. So this is not the will of the people, which I think is um, for the people on the other side. This is what's really frustrating to them. If there was 10,000 signatures. They may have a foundation. But you have four people that have come in consistently in council meetings saying the council, you're so great. You're so great. And then they've put this on the ballot. But jumping back to what you're saying, the rocky relationship, you know, define rocky. Because at the end of the day, the work of the county is still being done. I think people neglect that. When you walk into a council meeting, 
the first 15 minutes are all the legislation that we're passing. You know, they're, they're the final stamp of approval. There are a ton of great things that have happened just in the month of October. Our bond rating has gone up. We did our groundbreaking ceremony at the airport for the set. You know, it took seven years for us to get this runway extension uh, started. We just did a groundbreaking with a brand new developer. We just swore in our new ARF chief and, and their stuff. Like we have done some really great things, but the relationship is not supposed to just be, you know, peaches and cream all the time. There's supposed to be some conflict because that's when the rubber stamping occurs. That's when you have the corruption. Um, you know, they're supposed to battle a little bit, you know, and, and I think that that's just the way that it's set up. Those are the checks and balances. Um, you know, we keep hearing, oh, well, there's this, you know, situation and it's rocky here and rocky here. But at the end of the day, the work is still getting done and great things are happening in this county. We're moving forward with water and sewer. Uh, we have a great team in place for that. So to to sit there and say, oh, well, it's so dysfunctional, but look at the outcome. And we've done a lot of great things, you know, in the in the two years of my administration. And Bob, you know, achieved a lot as well. So, um, you know, and then the other argument is, who's the common denominator? It's not Bob Culver. It's not Julie Giordano. There's a couple people on the council that it's been the common denominator the entire time. And I think that you can't ignore that, you know. And I don't think you keep hearing, well, they've never really accepted this form of government. Since the charter was put into place, there was a balance of power. And slowly but surely, different, you know, and, and there have been articles written about it. They're chipping away and chipping away and chipping away at the executive branch to give themselves more power. And their argument right now is the executive has too much power, so we want all the power. And it just, it doesn't really make sense to me. So just, you know, kind of bringing it all home in this situation is we're not supposed to always get along. You know, the legislative body and the executive body are not always supposed to get along. Um, and I think that you see that mirrored throughout, you know, throughout the state, throughout. There wasn't every single time that Governor Westmore is going to agree with, you know, what's going on in the legislature. Same with Larry Hogan, same with Donald Trump, same with Joe Biden. Like, you know, there's there's going to be disagreements and that's just the way it is. But those are the checks and balances. Well, one of the things that's pointed to is this um, sense that the county executive, both yours, but also Bob Culver, mm -hmm. uh, would go and do things that uh, the council that you didn't know about or was not involved with. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of Culver, there was a, a tax sales cancellation that they were involved, that were not involved with. Obviously, they talk about, well, the radios, I guess, and for the sheriff, I guess, the latest on for, on your end. Mm -hmm. What about that disconnect between the county council, county executive doing something without that coordination with the with the the council itself. I mean, is there a gap here? What's what's going on when when you sit in that seat, mm -hmm. as Culver did, sat in that seat? What are you seeing in terms of that connection, particularly big issues that that certainly would uh, catch the council's attention? So I think there's a lot of things that would not be big issues normally. I mean, you know, if you're talking about, well, I don't want to speak too much for Bob because he's not even here to defend himself. Sure. So the fact that they're consistently attacking him and things that he did, I think in itself is pretty disgusting. But um, Bob, you know, I think my view of it is Bob was on the council and then came over into the executive side. So he saw both sides of it. And for him to be, um, from what I have saw, as frustrated as he was with things, there has to be, you know, some reasoning behind it, you know, seeing it from the other side. As far as the um, radios and things like that, so um, if we're talking about MOUs, I've done 41 MOUs, 41. Um, two have caused a little bit of concern, the safari at the quarry and then the eastern shore undercover one. Um that's a 96% approval rating. It's like pretty, you know, it's not too bad. So I think that there have been things that have been blown out of proportion um, by specific members of, uh, you know, of our, you know, some citizens that have come in. And the council just thrives on that. You know, they thrive on it. You know, they have turned their council meetings into like Jerry Springer episodes. I mean, it's embarrassing. You know, you get the work done and then all of a sudden these public comments come up. They literally have rules in place that say there's no personal attacks. There's no this. There's no that. But if it comes to me, they just allow them to go off. I mean, that is not how government should run at all. If I was on that council and I had that gavel in my hand, I would say to citizens, this is not what we're here for. If you have a concern, state your concern. But we are not going to attack any elected official because that's not what you're here to do. Um, jumping to the radio situation, um, I, we have just a difference of opinion of transparency. 
just a bottom line. Um, there is an attorney general opinion that says police communications are public record. So it's not so much that, um, you know, we're talking about the timeliness of it. And the current attorney general is working on a new uh, opinion, which is why this uh, MOU is paused. I know everyone says, oh, you can't pause an MOU. We've paused the MOU. I have the radio back. Um and we're going to see what the attorney general's opinion is, which should be coming out at the end of this year. So there is an issue across the state with encryption because people feel that they have a right to know what is going on. The question is when and how much information. So hopefully we'll get a little bit more insight with the attorney general. So let me actually drill down a little on this for sure. this particular aspect of it, which <clears throat> is that um, I heard all the stuff that on the and the, the city count uh, the, the county council on your remarks and so on mm -hmm. the thing that struck me the most was that um this is something that should have been passed by the county sheriff and i don't mean just simply an email but to, to sit down and say oh well let's like make sure they're on board that, that we mm -hmm. understand what we're doing um, and it seems to me that that's where the gap lies mm -hmm. because I know there were some emails exchanged and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. but this is such a significant issue that it would require an, a reach out to, for instance, the, the sheriff. And the reason why I bring this up is because there seems to then be this gap, whether it's you or it's Bob Culver, that matter, that sometimes these things happen maybe there should have been some outreach and there wasn't. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, here's the deal, you know, I mean, it's everything is a learning experience, right? So um, just so we're to clear and to clear that record, we have been in communication about encryption for six months before any of this went down. So this wasn't something that just all of a sudden I said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. This is something that we have been in, you know, and this is something that the sheriff and I disagree on. However, I have said, if you want to encrypt our radios, they're, they're emergency services radios. They're not the sheriff's office radios. They're emergency services, which falls under the county executive. I said, that is fine. But we need to figure out a way to get the information out. Across the state, they've been using something like Broadcastify. Like, there's different programs out there that create a 15-minute delay to ensure officer safety, making sure that, um, you know, uh, sensitive information isn't going out. Um, and so... We had talked about, you know, we had tried to have that communication and it was very much stonewalled at that point in time. Now, you know, did I make, you know, a haste decision? Maybe. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of people say, well, you just gave this to them. Well, no, I didn't. Like I, I contacted every news organization and said, is this something that you would be interested in? Can we work together to figure out a way to ensure transparency, considering the fact that police communications are considered public record? So that was the basis of it. There was nothing nefarious behind it. It wasn't like I was trying to be sneaky or whatever else. I was really trying to adhere to, and I don't think people realize, I got multiple complaints from citizens, multiple complaints saying, there's no transparency. Why are you hiding things? What is he hiding? You know, and that kind of thing. So you're really stuck between a rock and a hard place. And when you try to reach out and you're completely stonewalled and ignored, you're kind of like, okay, I'm going to make this decision on my own. I asked for that communication and collaboration and got nothing. So um, definitely got his attention when the MOU went out. So, but like I said, it is what it is. And like I said, you know, you, you make decisions as a leader at the time where you think this could be a positive thing. And they may not be. You know, I'm not perfect. I've never once said I was infallible of, you know, of, and, you know, whatever. So there are, there are decisions that could have been done differently. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, overall, when you look, if there are two things that I've done, whether it's this MOU or the safari at the quarry or whatever it was, you know, we all make mistakes. And like, and, and really the safari at the quarry, I don't think was a mistake. It was a great event. We made, you know, whatever else, but be that as it may, there were some people that were upset, but you make mistakes as a leader, you move on, you figure it out, but you don't eliminate a position because of two things that happen. You either elect somebody new or you have that conversation with somebody saying, Hey, look, this could have been better done. You know, I asked the sheriff to come in and meet with me afterwards to have a discussion he chose not to. He chose to go into the council meeting and make a spectacle. So, I mean, that's that's just a choice he made. So um, I asked for communication. I got none. I want to also dive into something that has been brought up, obviously, by people, and that is a, a campaign contributions, contributions sure. to friends organization. Mm -hmm. And this connection, obviously, the $3,500 contribution by the uh, undercover Eastern Shore people. Um, and uh, I, I pose this question, certainly to Canon as well. I said, well, isn't this part of the problem with financing privately campaign campaigns themselves suggesting for instance if somebody gave something to if 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 John Cannon did something and then we saw a contribution it benefited somebody wouldn't that be the same mm -hmm. his view was that um 
that this was much more extreme in the sense of this is something that that perhaps one would say if a member of council would then recuse themselves. They would not necessarily involve that kind of close relationship. But what about that? That yeah, John Cannon votes on the right. budget and, and property tax rate and all that stuff. And that's not, I mean, come on. Like, Explain yourself there. Yeah. So my thing is, is that never in my life did I think that I, $3,500 is not, like, to me, I'm like, the, the, the maximum is 6000 And really, you can even be strategic where he, his wife, this person, this person could give you, like, I don't view it as a bribe at all. I mean, and that's what they keep saying. Oh, they bribed you. They did this. They did that. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. They keep analyzing my campaign finances. These are people that support me. And if you look across the board, I mean, I can't help it. They don't get any contributions. Maybe people don't support them. I don't know. But um, these, you know, but okay, here's an example. Bob Benson, who is the council attorney, gave a donation to Joe Holloway. Could anybody say, well, you had Andy Mitchell as your attorney. Now you have Bob Benson. Was well, it because he made a contribution to you, Joe? No, it's not because he supported Joe Holloway. That's why. So I don't understand, like, the the Norse who own Evo, they gave me a huge donation. Um, I had Sandy over at uh, Pohanka. She supports me. So I don't understand how, th- are they not bribes too? Like, I just don't understand, like, I, I don't know. I think that they're really grasping at straws here. Honestly, people donate to people's campaigns because they support them. And in this particular case, this was way before any of this. I literally had a business event. We were celebrating being a more business friendly county as we move forward with, with the legislation for the liquor. And people came out and they supported it. And he was just a sponsor of this event. Like it was just a cam. It was a fundraiser, like as a campaign. And he was a sponsor. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think it's ridiculous, but if that's, I mean, if they're grasping at straws, that's fine. If they're going to overanalyze every little thing, so. Let me ask you one other thing, because uh, it kind of brought this up. They referred to a recent survey in which 25% of employees experienced, in his words, harassment, intimidation, and bullying on the job, and it's been a 20% turnover. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? I wanted to get your response to that, because he raised it. Sure. So the 25%, it's funny that he says that, because it was um, most of the comments, which he did not see, were all about the county council. So um, I think it's funny that he's talking about that they've experienced harassment and and a hostile work environment, but it's actually due to the fact of most people having to deal with the county council and the things that they have said to them. If you watch council meetings, you will see um, over the last, I would probably say year, I've taken a lot of arrows, which has been good because then they're not shooting the arrows at my staff. Um, But they were terrible. Staff have left because of that. I mean, I'm not going to call out any names, but there are specific staff that have left, people that haven't taken jobs, and it's specifically because of the county council and their behavior and how they treat employees. As far as the 20% uh, turnover rate, um, there are a lot of things that have happened, um, you know, but I don't know how accurate that figure is. But um, we have done a great job at figuring out and building a team. And so, you know, that just happens. You know, there are administrations that come in and clean everybody out. You know what I mean? That just happens. Like, I love that these people act like these are some crazy, it's some crazy anomaly with government. It's not. When it's a new administration, new staff happens. I mean, that's just the way it is. And to sit there and say that there's a turnover rate or there's new employees or whatever, when I came in, there was no one in the office but Lisa and AK. There was no director. There was no deputy director. There was no direct, there was no um, health department officer, you know, or the, the person who leads the health department the director. There was no um, HR director. There was like, there was there was a skeleton staff. So to sit there and say that, I think is just I mean, you can make data, you know, you can analyze data any way you want to. So I view it a little bit differently. I'm happy with the team that we built. Um, we have people coming from the state that want to come work for us because our administration is making gains. And so I just hope people see that and they set the political noise aside and really see the good work that we're doing. I mean, I show it every day on Facebook. I show it. You know, this is, these are the things that we're doing. To sit there and say that this is not a functional government, but yet in one year we got a higher bond rating score, like that says something. Sorry, that's something that we're doing. And, you know, we, I think the proof is there that we are a functional government. The way that it's set up, I mean, literally that's what Moody said. We are upgrading you because of the governance. So, I mean, you can say it all you want, you know. Um, I hold the council accountable. I do not cater to them. I do not, um, you know, I question some of the things that they do and they don't like it. They don't like being questioned. They don't like having checks and balances. And that's why I really feel this is what's why they're doing this. They don't like being questioned on things. And this is the first time 
um, that this I think the community is seeing, um, you know, how th- how they behave and how they treat people. And, um, you know, I mean, it is what it is. And, you know, for John to sit there and say, well, it's because of the executive office on everything. I mean, you've got to, you know, the council's part of that, too. So I think that they need to take some responsibility on that as well. Finally, in terms of this amendment, mm-hmm. if it, for instance, does pass mm-hmm. and the position is eliminated, what do you see that meaning for the governance of the county itself, and what does that mean about your own personal future? So for the county itself, I feel really worried, um, especially because four of the councilmen have said they're not running again. So you throw a grenade and then you just walk away. And to do that to this county um, is really concerning to me. We have a lot of things moving forward that I am afraid are going to be halted, one of them being water and sewer. I have um, really formulated an amazing team of people that are there because they're working for me, not because they, you know, I mean, they like Wacomico County, don't get me wrong, but we have built this, you know, team of trust and this team, you know, of, of people. I've pulled people from MDE. I've pulled people from the Department of Planning. I have people from, um, you know, just different private organizations that have come together to say, we're going to do this. And I am very worried that that is going to be halted. Um, I have department heads who will pack their bags and leave because they're not going to work for the council. They're not going to. Um, So I feel very worried for this county. I think it is a giant step in the wrong direction. Um, When you look at a council manic form of government, you look at counties like Kent County, it's 19,000 people. You look at Worcester County, it's 53,000 people. I talked to Weston, who has, uh, he's worked for both. um, And uh, um, Weston Young, for those people who don't know, he's the um, county administrator in uh, Worcester. Um, He has 53,000 people. And I asked him, I said, with the staff that you have now, could you handle 104,000 constituents? And he said, absolutely not. So what they have proposed is a government structure that's very similar to Worcester, yet there's no deputy. So it's really one less. So they're not going to be able to complete the work that's being done. Um, As far as myself, I'm not worried about myself. And I'll tell you why. So right now I'm on political leave, technically. So I very easily could just go back in my classroom, teach. Um, I may run for council. I've talked about it. Um, And I have, you know, depending on, you know, where I live, my constituents are big supporters of me. I would have no problem winning that election. Um, And, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll sit in the seat with a gavel. Who knows? But I've also been offered a job on the other side of the bridge. So I'm not worried about me. What I'm worried about are the people that are in my office because they don't deserve this. You know, Bunky Luffman is a great guy. He has worked under, you know, Governor Hogan. I mean, he has such a plethora of knowledge. And, you know, to have the people who are supporting this amendment say to his son, his son's out campaigning for his dad, and to say, oh, don't worry, you know, um, your dad will find another job. You don't say that to a child. You know, th- that that side has, I mean, people are comparing them to feral cats outside of the Civic Center because they're just, they're so aggressive and so nasty and so negative. And, it, and it's really a shame, but I'm worried about Bunky. I'm worried about Matt Leitzel. I'm worried about Lisa and AK who do amazing constituent work. Those are the people that I'm worried about. I'm going to be just fine. Wacomico County Executive Julie Giordano. Voters will decide next Tuesday on whether they want to keep the position after nearly two decades. You're listening to Dumb Marva Today. This is Don Rush. Del Marva Today with Don Rush.